Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning, both of those at home watching live or later recorded, those in the pews. I don't know if there's anybody in the parking lot today, but if they pull up, they're good. They're, we're welcoming them too. I'm glad you're all here today. Uh, today is, if you're keeping score, the ninth Sunday after Pentecost. So we're a couple months in to this longest season of the church year. Uh, we have a few announcements to share with you today. Uh, you might notice something out in the narthex, and since I was at the letters, there you are. Do you want to come up to the mic so the folks at home can hear too? <laughs> Please. <laughs> Any mic you want. We got three. I'll slide over. You can take that one. <laughs> Again this year we're collecting uh, school supplies for the foster children and it's pretty much like it has been in the past. The uh, poster is out in the narthex and if you would take as many little papers as you can, um, we would really appreciate you helping us. They really appreciate it and it's, you have to turn them in one week early this week because some of the schools are uh, going back a week early. So um, that's about all. When, where should they bring them? Oh, bring them back to church by <laughs> <laughs> August 15th. And then there's going to be a box out there that you can put them in. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sharon. And while you're getting those wonderful back to school sales to help. Uh, for the foster kids, so they have all the supplies they need to be ready to go back to school the first day. You might as well buy some extra for MSEF, because if you look in your bulletin, we're getting school supplies for MSEF too. It's so important uh, for a kid to have everything they need on that first day back. It just makes everything else easier. So on two different fronts, uh, we can be helping some kids be ready for school and uh, get a good start. Um, also, two garden-related announcements. First of all, uh, we're back to having an altar that we're using in the building. And so now we have a sign-up sheet out in the narthex for altar flowers. So if you'd like to sponsor the altar flowers, all the instructions are in your bulletin. And if you want to sponsor the flowers being grown, you can sign up and call up to help at the community garden for all souls. It's probably mostly vegetables, but, you know, they have flowers that, I don't know, squash blossom bouquet, perhaps. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, if you would like to help weed and tend to that garden that feeds a lot of people, Please look in your bulletin for information on that. Uh, let's see. Coming up this week, our series continues called New Normals Are Messy, uh, Conversations in Ezra and Nehemiah. If you haven't heard the last couple weeks, it's the, the part of the history of the Old Testament when the Israelites come back from exile to rebuild in Jerusalem, bring the temple back, bring the worship back. Well, we've been gone, maybe not 70 years of exile, but a year and a half of pandemic. So we're going to learn from their experience and see what uh, it has to teach us as we return to our routines. Uh, Becky has an announcement as well. I'm going to make you use the mic too. That's, that's just the new thing. we got people listening at home. Get a mic. We're going to have a, uh, a wireless mic somewhere in the near future. Then I'll just hand it to you. I'll be like uh, Phil Donahue, if anybody remembers that. Yeah. Routinely, we have First Sunday Fellowship recently. It's been a car roaming in the parking lot, but we're going to be in the building. However, I won't be here next week, so we're going to have First Sunday Fellowship on Second Sunday, <laughs> which will be the 8th. Does that sound right? Uh, so if anybody wants to bring something, I'm going to have things set up here in advance because I don't want to interfere with All Souls Worship and um, just plan to hang out a little bit afterwards. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, lastly, and I wanted to make sure I said this one at the end so everybody uh, could remember it, uh, we will be having a memorial service on Saturday at 1 p.m. for Judy Schwartfinger. Uh, didn't have that confirmed before the bulletins were printed, so we'll send out an email as well to remind everybody. Uh, but this Saturday at 1 o'clock, uh, we'll celebrate Judy's life and mourn her passing, hold on to God's promises, and lean on each other uh, in that time. I know that Charlie has expressed to me uh, some, some gratitude on behalf of all your prayers and love, and uh, I know that will continue. Um, all Souls is all set up in the fellowship hall, as Becky mentioned. 
uh, but I've been talking with Reverend Catherine, and it is no problem. We're going to put the chairs away and slide some stuff to the side so we can have a small reception afterwards in the fellowship hall um, and uh, have a chance to tell some stories because all of you probably have some stories that each other haven't heard, and that's a, a holy time to be able to share those stories. So I hope uh, many of you can make it this Saturday at one o'clock. I believe that's the things that we needed to share today out loud. There are a few other announcements in your bulletins with regard to resources in the community. Please check those out. Uh, as you are able, I invite you to stand, and we will begin our worship together with confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our gathering song today is, Open Now Thy Gates of Beauty.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray together. Gracious God, you have placed within the hearts of all your children a longing for your word and a hunger for your truth. Grant that we may know your Son to be the true bread of heaven and share this bread with all the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. The first lesson is from 2 Kings, the fourth chapter. Today's reading is part of a larger section of 2 Kings that describes the miracles of Elisha the successor to Elijah. Here the prophet gives food to a hungry crowd. Though there is not enough food to go around, Elisha trusts God, who provides enough and even more to satisfy the need. A reading from 2 Kings. A man came from Baal Shalisha, bringing food from the first fruits to Elisha, the man of God. Twenty loaves of barley, and fresh ears of grain in his sack. Elisha said, Give it to the people and let them eat. But his servant said, How can I set this before a hundred people? So he repeated, Give it to the people and let them eat. For thus says the Lord, They shall eat and have some left. He set it before them. They ate and had some left, according to the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord. The second lesson is from Ephesians, the third chapter. We have been rooted and grounded in the love of Christ, which surpasses all human knowledge. Because Christ dwells in our hearts, our lives are continuously strengthened and empowered by the ongoing presence of the Spirit. A reading from Ephesians. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through the Spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. You are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than we all can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. The word of the Lord. Be to God. Please stand. Our gospel today comes from John, the sixth chapter. In John's gospel, the miracles of Jesus are called signs because they reveal the true character of God. As such, they remain within the mystery of God and cannot be brought under human control. The Holy Gospel, according to John. Glory, Glory to you, Lord. Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now to Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, well, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but... What are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. And there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about five thousand in all. 
Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, Gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land forward, the land toward which they were going. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. Please be seated. Uh, I'm going to do a quick little instructions on the children's sermon. Uh, the kids that are in here, I think, got the envelope. That's what's in here. Uh, if folks at home can wait a little bit, I will post this PDF into the Facebook comments, and uh, hopefully we'll get it over to the YouTube page too, but you'll have this to, to print out. So what this is, it's a bunch of bread. Uh, for those of you who don't follow the lectionary like a pastor does, once every three years in our reading schedule for all the lessons that we read in church, we get this summer, we get this stretch where we have John's Gospel, and for something like five weeks, it's nothing but bread. <laughs> bread, bread, bread. So we get the feeding of the 5,000, and then there's like four weeks in a row of Jesus just saying, I'm the bread, in slightly different ways. So it's rough on us. I imagine it could be rough on all of you, too. That's why today I'm going to talk mostly about Ephesians. However, for the kids, since you'll be hearing about bread a lot, we've got this bread matching game. Um, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven... Eight kinds of bread, plus some communion wafers, plus Jesus, the bread of life. Mix them up, shuffle them around, see how many matches you can make. Play with your friends, play with your siblings. Um, but hopefully this gives you some visual bread to look at while I'm talking about bread and related bread matters up here. Enjoy. So let's cut right to the chase today. No story, no cute thing to start. I think we have all heard this story before from the Gospel. Um, not only are we hearing about bread for the next multiple weeks in a row, but we hear this story on a regular basis. It's one of the few that is in all four of the Gospels. It is, of course, Jesus feeding these people who are hungry, this big crowd. Uh, we've heard it so many times that we pretty much have the stat lines memorized. Okay, we've got 5,000 people, five loaves, two fish, uh, 12 baskets of leftovers. We have one astounded crowd uh, who is ready to make Jesus king by force. And for dessert, we get 12 disciples in a boat and who are terrified and astounded at the sight of Jesus walking on the water. And don't forget, we also had an appetizer today. We had the story from 2 Kings about Elisha performing pretty much the same feeding miracle that Jesus did. That's why they were like, hey, it's the prophet. Elisha's is a less familiar story, but it has the same kind of message that we get from John. God's abundance outstrips our expectations. Not only were the crowd's physical needs met, uh, and the day's hunger sated on that grassy plain, but there were leftovers of plenty, and there was amazement galore in Jesus' wake. He provided well beyond their needs. Miracle stories like this point to God's love and provision for us overall, not just our physical, our bodily needs. But they also point to the extravagant, overwhelming love that God showed us through Jesus' life and ministry, through his death and resurrection, and through the Holy Spirit's movement in our lives. 
God satisfies so much than just our empty bellies. Through Christ, God defeats sin and death, gives hope, works for justice and reconciliation, forgives sins, makes us free. So we have Elijah, we have John. They work together really nicely, feeding people, God going beyond what we need. So then I was reading the lesson from Ephesians, Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And at first I thought, oh, this backs it up really nicely. How nice. I don't have to think too hard. Uh, there's phrases like the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. It says it's able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we could ask or imagine. So I was thinking that this sermon today would be all about this, this mind-blowing love that God shows us. And that I would be reminding all of you to be open to experiencing that love in your lives. Easy peasy. But then I kept reading Ephesians. And I realized that the sermon has to go a little further than that. Because Paul goes further than that. Because God goes further than that. This letter, this lesson from Ephesians isn't just about how amazing God's love is. How it defies our logic and our definitions. The prayer that we heard from Paul today is dedicated to the God who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish far more than we could ask or imagine. It's more than just experiencing God's love, sitting back and saying, wow. It's more than just rubbing our tummies once we're fed. We have a part to play in all of this. We have a God-given part to play. We're not just grateful spectators ooing and eyeing at the wonderful things that God does for us. Paul is praying that this gracious, amazing love would be delivered and implemented through us. Lost my sandwich. Test, test. I stepped on a cord. <laughs> we'll go back a minute. So we're not just sitting back and doing an eye. We're, we're not just receiving God's wonderful love. Paul is praying that this gracious, amazing love of God to be delivered and implemented through us. Through the church. How about that? Some background, this letter was written to the Ephesians, which was the congregations in and around the city of Ephesus, which is in modern-day Turkey. Uh, this was a region very much in line culturally with the Roman Empire at that time, and the recipients of this letter were almost certainly Gentiles. As we heard last week in Ephesians, these Gentiles were not originally part of Israel. They were not originally heirs of the promises of God and the covenants in the Old Testament. Um, they were not members of the same body as the Jewish people, as the Hebrews. Um, the Gentiles um, were not a central part of the story of God's people up until this point. They were, as we heard last week, far off. Well, Jesus dying on the cross broke down those separating walls, and Paul carried this gospel, this good news, to Gentiles all over the place. They were in now. They were near and many heard the good news and were changed. But as is often the case, change takes time. And these Ephesians, these Gentiles, were new to all of this, and they weren't sure what their place in all of this was. They were growing into their identities as Christians and trying to figure out what it meant to be a Christian when all the other Christians were Jews. And how all these rituals and all these customs and promises and, and vocabulary. The Ephesians were thinking about their purpose, their part in God's story. And so our lesson from Ephesians today is a prayer. It's a prayer that Paul is saying um, for them to be empowered. And when you listen to it, it really does sound like Paul is praying for God to empower the Ephesians, to pour power into these members of the church until it overflows. Paul is saying, look at what God did through me, a lowly man who once tried to destroy the very thing that I'm now carrying to you, the very thing I'm now seeking to increase on God's behalf. Look what God is doing through me. And just imagine what God will do through you. It doesn't matter if you're new to all of this. It doesn't matter if you were far off a few months ago. It doesn't matter if you're still searching and figuring things out. Or if you're still hungry for meaning. God will fill you up. Yes. 
and there will also be abundance left over, abundance to share so that nothing and no one would be lost. Even though I hear plainly that this Ephesians prayer is asking for us to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, to know that something is beyond our knowing, still the power and the promise of these words inspire me and make me truly believe and have faith that I really can know the unknowable and that I really can be a channel for God's love, God's unbelievable love, it flies in the face of all logic and reason, but God's going to fill me up until I can be leftovers for everybody else. 25 years ago, before I went to seminary, I knew practically nothing about the Bible, about being Lutheran, about being Christian for that matter. I'd gone to the classes, I went to Sunday school, I did confirmation. But I'm not exaggerating. Our, our fellowship hall at my home church growing up was called the Martin Luther Room. Okay? Pretty standard. <laughs> It was almost in high school before I realized that Martin Luther was, you know, important. Our namesake, not Martin Luther King Jr. Oh, it's this other guy. I just went to church every Sunday. I did what was expected. The people were nice. But that was it. I didn't yet know that there was more. I didn't know about the power at work within us that is able to accomplish more than all we can ask or imagine. I was in the church. I was loved. But I was still pretty far off. I ended up being a pastor. That's, that's my call from God that I discerned over time. And each of us has a different call. In our professions, in our passions, in our families, our relationships. We are all different members of the one body of Christ. We all have different gifts, different abilities, different talents, different hearts that God is at work in. Paul is inviting the Ephesians to seek out and embrace their unique gifts and callings, their unique ways to be open to God's love and embrace God's working through them and accomplishing abundantly far more than what we can ask or imagine. And I invite all of you, both as individuals and as Messiah, to do the same, to seek out your gifts, to embrace your abilities, because the Holy Spirit is moving us from passive awe Mm, full tummy, thanks God, to active work, multiplied by God to feed the world in love. And I also invite you to go back and read this Ephesians passage again a few times in the coming week. Each time that you do, I want you to substitute the word ability for the word power. I think power is in there three times. In Paul's time, in Greek, that's what power meant. It meant the capacity, the ability, the potential to do something. If we read this passage in that light, we hear Paul praying that God would strengthen us in our inner being with ability through the Spirit. Not just a nice feeling, but ability to do something. Because we are rooted and grounded in love. Paul prays that we might have the ability to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, the cosmically vast dimensions of God's love. Paul prays to our God who by the potential and ability at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we could ask or imagine. There will be so many fragments left over, baskets full, ready to astound us. Wow, what a miracle, yes. And also ready to go through us to nourish others. As it says, when Jesus collects those leftovers so that nothing and no one will be lost. My hope is that if you reread this prayer, this passage in that way, you'll realize that every one of you has the ability and the power to move from passive awe to active work. Full participation in God's kingdom work in the world. Each of you has a vital part in God's kingdom. A role to play in God's mission, to listen and to respond, to encourage and challenge, to teach and to share, to give and to advocate, to forgive and to reconcile, to love and to serve. Whatever it looks like for you. It took me a while to figure it out, and here I am. It took a while for the Ephesians to figure it out. What is it for you? Imagine the possibilities of what is happening in your lives right now through all your relationships and interactions and callings. 
We aren't just recipients of God's love. Each one of us is an instrument of God's love, of God's will, of God's provision. We forget this sometimes. Sometimes we just sit back in awe, stuck in receive mode. Sometimes we're like the disciples on the lake, gobsmacked and terrified at the lengths and depths and height and breadth that Jesus will go to to come to us and show us love and say, don't be afraid. Sometimes we try to contain or control the power, the ability, the gifts. We try not to use them the way they are intended to be used. Kind of like the crowd forcing Jesus to be their earthly king. Sometimes we just miss the point. Sometimes we do not allow ourselves to be used the way God intends. And we'll say things like, we can't. We're not, we're not able to do that, sorry. That's somebody else's job, not mine. Somebody else's gift. Sometimes we forget that all of this is a process. That any change and growth takes time. That it takes time for us instruments to get in tune with God. God loves us despite all of the resistance and hesitance and impatience and forgetfulness. God still uses us as instruments of God's incomprehensible love. He uses us to bring about the kingdom and feed the people who are hungry, whether that's for food or love or anything else. God has still given us the ability to pray, as Paul does in Ephesians, that we would feel the power of God working through us, the love of Christ filling us, the presence of the Spirit strengthening our inner being and animating our actions. We are grounded, firmly rooted in God's love, and through that love, anything is possible. I pray that we may all have faith that God's love does work through us in small ways and large ways, able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we could ask or imagine. And what makes all of this possible is beyond our ability, our understanding. But it's God's power, God's ability that is working through us. For God is able. God is powerful. God is able not only to feed, not only to walk on water, to do all these miraculous things that we read about. God is able to do all of this through us. If that's not a miracle. Can you believe it? Okay, the answer is yes. God is at work. God is able. God is so gracious that God even works through us grants us gifts, gives us the gift of Jesus Christ so that we might grasp and comprehend and believe and pray that we are more than only recipients but also instruments of God's love. And I pray that you may have the power and the ability to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God, filled with some left over to be shared so that nothing and no one will be lost. Amen. Our hymn of the day is Break Now the Bread of Life.
Together with one voice, let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Rooted in Christ and sustained by the Spirit, we offer our prayers for the Church, the world, and all of creation. We pray for the Church, bless the ministries of our neighboring congregations, empower churches throughout the world, and encourage missionaries who accompany global neighborhoods. Kindle in us a spirit of collaboration, that all people may know your loving works. Hear us, O God. We pray for creation. Send rain to lands experiencing drought, and come to the aid of those enduring sweltering heat. Nurture wheat and barley crops grown for the nourishment of your people, and conserve aquatic habitats and fish populations. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We pray for those who govern, cast out arrogance, selfishness, and corruption, and instruct those who lead to practice compassion and humility. Inspire them with a vision of the common good and a commitment to ensure that all who hunger are fed. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We pray for those bowed down by heavy burdens, those who are unemployed or underemployed, those unable to find affordable housing, and those without health insurance. Console those who grieve and hear the cries of those who call on you for healing. Especially we pray for each other. Debbie, Annette, Bruce, Johnny, Leroy, Adam, Bonnie, Ted, Stephen, Sue, Karen, Doc, Matt, Ruth, and family and friends of Judy. We pray for our extended family and neighbors, the family and friends of Mary, Dwayne, Linda, David, Emily, George, Pat, friend of Glenda, Ken and Dee, Tim, our veterans, their fellow soldiers and waiting families, all law enforcement, firefighters, and first responders, the people and pastor, Reverend Catherine of All Souls Episcopal, and our shared ministry, hospitals, nursing homes, other health care facilities, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the World Health Organization, medical researchers and scientists, schools, workplaces, government institutions, and municipal agencies, those affected by natural disasters, all those impacted by acts of violence at home and abroad, and for all who travel. Your mercy is great. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We pray for the, this assembly. Deepen our resolve to use what we have to serve those in need. When we worry that we do not have enough resources for ministry, assure us of your abundance. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We give thanks for those who have died. As you sustain them through all their days, so dwell in our hearts that we may have the power to comprehend with all the saints the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God, you are life. We pray for our world, our country, our community, and our church as we face the challenges of coronavirus. We pray for those who grieve, for the sick and their families, for the anxious, comfort them. 
We pray for those who have lost businesses and jobs. Restore them. We pray for those working and schooling at home and for those who remain isolated. Sustain them and protect them. We pray for all hospital and health care workers and all first responders. Provide for them and protect them. We pray for those who are making decisions about how to live into the future and the shape such a future will take. Guide them. We pray with thanksgiving for all vaccines and the treatments for those who develop them, test them, and administer them. Encourage them. Keep us all in your care as we continue to love our neighbors, near and far. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of all families, you have given us families to be sanctuaries of blessing, comfort, and love for each other. Under your protection, fill us with harmony, hope, and health. We pray this week for the Mahoftas, Major, and Martin families, as well as our Messiah family. Guard all of our hearts that we may display love instead of hate, anger, or bitterness. Lead us all to be grateful for your abiding love and enable us to glorify you by sharing that love with others. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We lift these and all our prayers to you, O oh God, confident in the promise of your saving love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all of us. And also with you. So we've been doing peace in place. We'll continue to do that for a while. That means just share peace with the folks immediately around you um, and share it in a way that everybody's comfortable with. If you still got masks, if you still have concerns, there's other non-physical ways to share the peace. And today might I suggest, with the Olympics having just started, that you share the peace and the form of your favorite Olympic event. I don't know, a javelin of peace. I know it's a contradiction. A uh, volleyball of peace. Spike it right at him. Um, uh, I don't know, whatever it could be. Uh, if you're going to shake hands, shake hands, that's fine. But, you know, get some Olympic peace out there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Is anybody back there? You don't need to shush, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> it's okay. Not like that. Carry on. Uh, I gotta find my place anyway. I wasn't ready. Uh, we are still collecting offerings uh, in plates at the doors. Uh, we asked that you drop your envelope off in there on your way out if you haven't already whatever contribution. If you're giving online through your bank or some other way, that's wonderful too. Uh, that helps just to, with the consistency of everything. Uh, we appreciate your generosity and your persistence through all of this. And to those watching at home too, you can always uh, drop off an offering, mail it in, or again, the electronic uh, method. So thanks to everybody. And at this time, we'll join together in our offering prayer. Let us pray together. Jesus, bread of life, you have set this table with your very self and called us to the feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us in this meal. Make us to be what we receive here, your body for the life of the world. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, 
Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who, on the cross, opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup. And he gave thanks, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. And a quick recap of the communion instructions. The lay assistants and the ushers and I will start communion up front. Then the ushers will begin to dismiss you forward to receive communion. I will start on the social distance side, and then we'll move to the other side. Please remember to keep some space between the different households as you move forward and receive. I'll be in the middle with the bread. On my right will be... Uh, who's first today? Karen. Karen will be on my right with the pouring chalice. Please grab your cup from the staff there, and she'll fill it for you. On my left will be Marilyn, and she will have the good old uh, wafer and grape juice all-in-ones that we have in the parking lot. Uh, so if you would prefer that, either for health reasons or grape juice reasons, um, please don't pick up a cup. Just come straight over to there. There are garbage cans on the sides as you return that way. You can drop things off there. I think that's it. Do we have anybody out in the parking lot for communion today? All right. Then we will begin.
Christ and blessing that you have received strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. Please receive this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Our sending song is, Let Us Talents and Tongues Employ. This is a guy like a Calypso feed, so I expect to see some of that. <laughs> <laughs>